This video is sort of like a reaction to the shootings in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm going to be discussing a little bit about the events that happened and I'm going to be talking about what I think will happen moving forward because it's always important to know where you are in the historical moment. Uh, what point in history are you at? You got to know where you are at. And I think that this video is going to be a little bit about that. Now, before anything, let's get out of the way the fact that it was a horrific shooting, the thing that happened in Christchurch. I mean, just uh, an awful thing. And the individuals who were killed were predominantly innocent people, from what I understand. I don't think any of them had been involved in anything nefarious, as far as I can tell. And insofar as the reports are concerned, they were all just uh, Muslims there, you know, praying or what have you, and they were shot up by this man, right? And that's horrible and we should feel nothing but uh, sorrow for the victims and especially their families who are of course left on this earth to suffer with their loss. That being said, we have to understand a few things right off the bat. You see, we've been living in a cold civil war for the last, oh, I'd venture to say roughly 30, 35 odd years, all right? I'm 51 and so I can sort of remember when things started up in this civil war that started on the cultural front but has slowly but surely migrated to the political front and it's about to turn violent and we can see it we can see the outlines of what is to come the thing about the united states that people don't quite understand and, and only very few and very insightful individuals have pointed out is that the united states true genius is its ability to compromise to come to political compromises where both sides or all sides seed enough so that the overall project that is the United States and the Western liberal democracies continue moving forward. The one time that the American democracy was not able to come to a consensus, to a grand compromise, that was the Civil War. Now, if you look at the history of the Civil War, you start to realize that it wasn't really about slavery. The explanation that it was about slavery was sort of like the, the, the post hoc argument straddled on to the conflict. The real conflict was, of course, federalization, centralization, central power, and homogeneity as opposed to the more decentralized, distributist approach that the southern states wanted. After the fact, people talked about slavery, but before the fact, it wasn't really about slavery. It was really about each individual state being able to chart its own path. And the northern states that wanted a centralized government because a centralized government would be much more powerful and would be able to project American interests more effectively around the world. That was the real argument. And there was no compromise on that issue. And that led to the Civil War. But what's important from our point of view is that if you look at the history of the Civil War, it took decades. The problem that erupted in the Civil War in 1861 to 1865, well, you could see that back in the time of Andrew Jackson, decades before the Civil War. In other words, it wasn't something that came out of the clear blue sky. We could see it decades before the eruption of the Civil War. All you had to do was just look at the time, and even the people at that time knew that some sort of Civil War was coming. And some of the more people with more foresight and more intelligence and, and more historical acumen could even divine what the shape of it would be decades before it actually happened. The same thing is happening now. See, in the 80s, I started seeing at least sort of like this divide, this cultural divide, where the, the political left and the political light, right could not seem to find any kind of cultural common ground and it started to sort of like divide between the two. In the early 90s especially, people started talking about the culture war. 
And I was there in college in the early 90s, and I could see how people were starting to, to pick sides between what was thought of as conservative and what was thought of as liberal. But it was more than just that, because there were a lot of attitudes that liberals had that were more conservative, quite frankly, and a lot of attitudes that conservatives had that were more liberal. It was not quite that clear dividing line between left and right. The fact is the dividing line was more between those who had access to political and cultural and economic power and those who did not. And, and there was this weird divide. And I myself, since I went to an elite university, I was sort of like on the side of the people who were like in power, the elites. And they had a particular vision of the world that was discordant from people that they looked down upon. They looked down upon them socially and culturally. They, they thought of them, quite frankly, as white trash. And they dismissed their, their desires, their needs, their wants. And they pursued habits and treaties and ideas and ideologies and, and cultural icons that were dismissive of that broad swath. Ross Perot was the first iteration that eventually brought us Donald Trump. Ross Perot was a Texas industrialist, a very successful man, who thought that NAFTA was a horrible idea. He correctly predicted that NAFTA would hollow out the industrial base of the United States and it would lead to millions of people being unemployed. He predicted that in 1992. He saw what NAFTA and free trade agreements would do to the American economy, and much more important than the American economy, what it would do to the American people. The opioid epidemic that's going on in the United States among the, the, the people of the so-called flyover states, the lack of hope, the, the unemployment, the chronic unemployment, all of these people who are overweight and miserable and sit in front of a TV or a video game eating themselves into a stupor. For all intents and purposes, Ross Perot saw that coming in 92, and he warned against it. That's why his campaign was so successful. Because even back in 1992, thoughtful people could see where neoliberal economic ideology was leading the United States. And, and here was a key thing that happened in the 90s that people don't quite seem to understand or, or give it sufficient weight. See, what happened was not that neoliberal economic policy won, but rather its opponents lost and lost catastrophically. I'm talking, of course, about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed economically, and everybody could see that. It wasn't an issue of a political collapse. The political collapse happened because the economy was going so poorly, the Soviet Union was not able to deliver the lifestyle that the people of the Eastern Bloc wanted. The people of the Warsaw Pact, you know, Poland and East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Belarusia and Russia and Ukraine, well, they were not living the kind of life that was readily available in the West. It was an economic collapse. And so when the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries collapsed economically, it wasn't just that an entire portion of the world collapsed economically. It's that the left in the Western democracies no longer had an economic ideology that they could present as a viable alternative to neoliberal economic policy. This was key. See, because without a viable economic policy that they could present as an alternative to the right, to the conservatives, to the neoliberals, right? What happened with the left, with the political left? Well, they had to simply embrace neoliberal economic policy as they did during the Clinton administration. I mean, Bill Clinton was a neoliberal at heart, of course, right? But in exchange for swapping out their Marxist economic ideology, they embraced identity politics, the culture of grievance, uh, the progressive stack, they embraced essentially racism disguised as a help to minorities. And they created a condition whereby the ultimate enemy was white people, white males. They are the great enemy, at least according to leftists. Leftists who have become this thing that we see today. We see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in her 
you know, fiscal insanity with this Green New Deal garbage nonsense. We see all of the candidates for the Democratic Party are subscribing to intersectionality. And uh, what, what is this ideology? It basically demonizes those who are not people of color and those who are not of marginal groups. And who is the person in, in this cultural context who is the opposite of the marginal group, at least on paper? The white male. The white male is the enemy. The white guy did it. The white guy is the bad guy. The white guy must be stopped. You see it all the time on Twitter. Yeah, you see it all the time with the blue check marks. And they are shitting on white people all the time because white people are the designated enemy. White people are the evil people. White people, males especially, but not just necessarily, White people are the people who oppress the people of color. They are the people who want borders and barriers to stop unfettered immigration. They are the reason that the Green New Deal is not passed. They are the, the, the root cause of everything bad in the world, according to this ideology, is the white male. The whites did it. If you have successfully identified the root cause of all the misery in your society, what's the solution? Well, it's quite obvious now, isn't it? It's the elimination of the white male. Yeah, if you identify Satan, you gotta kill Satan now, don't you? So what's going on, of course, is that, see, white people in general recognize that they are under assault by a rather substantial portion of the population. And this has expressed itself culturally for several decades now, you know, insofar as feminism is concerned and, and the, uh, the fetish, fetishization of people of color, which is, I personally find that bizarre, but that's what's going on, of course. Uh, people of color, people who are of uh, African descent or Middle Eastern descent or Asian descent, although not all Asians, just some of them, well, they are being elevated to, to some status of some sort of like angelic being who, beings who can do no wrong, which is crazy. But that's what's going on. And so, of course, what's happening is that white people are starting to feel the crunch. When white people elected Donald Trump, let's not kid ourselves, 90% of the black electorate voted for Hillary Clinton, right? I mean, nine to one against Trump, right? Uh, ditto with other marginalized groups or other uh, ethnic minorities, right? They all voted against Trump. Trump won because of the white voters. Why? Because the white voters have been feeling under stress, under strain. They have no jobs, no opportunity, no future. And it is because the elites on the coasts have seen to it that this happens. They exported the jobs that were traditionally of the white working classes. They have imported huge swaths of foreign people who do not integrate, at least not easily, not into the United States culture. And they are actively promulgating the destruction of white people. So the fact of the matter is, at least to me, is, is not so much that we had this uh, a terrorist incident of a white guy shooting up a mosque. That's not what's surprising. What's surprising is that uh, there, there have been so few. That's the real surprise. Because y you have the elites and a substantial portion of the population that actively want to eliminate a whole other group of people in the country. And they've been saying it for years. And they've been demonizing this group of people, white people, for years. So the surprise is not the attack at Christ Church. The surprise that it's been you know, so few and far between. But that's gonna change. I think that the Christ Church killer uh, was onto something. I think that he was a very shrewd individual, you know, bloodthirsty and cold-hearted and whatever you wanna call him, a murderer, certainly. You can call him all sorts of names, but stupid he was not. Because I think that he correctly anticipated that the, the left, the elites, the people in power, they will overreact to this. And they will abuse the white population even further. You know, I myself, as a Hispanic, if you will, you know, not even properly white, I'm a POC, right? I can see this. I can see how the elites want to oppress that segment up the population even further because they have been indoctrinated in an ideology, intersectionality, which calls for that, 
which says actively and, and explicitly that those people who are white are evil. Those people who are uneducated, who might not have the best economic situation, those people are evil and should be expunged, abused, destroyed. And this is what the elites are doing. And this is what they are going to continue to do against white people. The, the war, white working classes in the United States. And so there, there's only two options, acceptance or rebellion. I personally think that it's going to be a rebellion. I think that as the elites and these, um, you know, the, the, these intersectional people start squeezing the white working classes even more and more than what they are already doing, stamping them down, you know, with their boot heel on their necks, I think it's inevitable. I think that there will be a rebellion. And I think that a lot of fair-minded people are going to start siding with the white working class people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are headed into a civil war. And I think that this incident in Christchurch, if there are more like it that come from disenfranchised young men who feel that there is no hope, that their lives are meaningless, and that any opportunity, any goodness in their lives has been taken away from them by this insane ideology, well, I think that there will be more violence and there will be a lot more incidents like this. And it will target not only Muslims, but also other quote unquote people of color, as well as feminists. And we have seen this over the years, just little, little hints of this. The Oklahoma City bombing in 94 or 95, was it? Uh, uh, the, 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 um, I, the Soldini, the, the, the man, the disenfranchised uh, man who was a 40-year-old odd uh, virgin who felt that uh, feminism had robbed him of the ability to have a family of his own and he wound up uh, murdering a whole bunch of women at some yoga class. I mean, we have seen little eruptions, but something about Christchurch, and perhaps I'm just being, you know, just being foolish here, but there's something about Christchurch that feels different, as if a tipping point had been reached, as if the man who committed this uh, murder, this atrocity, is giving tacit permission to others like him to follow in his lead. That's why I do believe that there will be more incidents like Christchurch. And I think that more and more young men are going to start organizing because I think that they are going to become, begin to recognize that they have no hope. And the only hope that they have for any kind of future for themselves is to rebel, rebel against their annihilation. Because it has to be understood, you see, there is a side of the population in the Western democracies that truly and openly and articulately wants the destruction of these disenfranchised young men. They want them gone. And so if somebody wants you gone, what do you do? If you can't go anywhere, will you fight? Or do you go gentle into that good night? You tell me. It gives me no real pleasure to be talking about these things. And it gives me no real satisfaction to sort of like intuit what's to come. But I do believe that the Christchurch incident uh, shooting, I think that this is the beginning of the end. I think that the cold civil war that we have been experiencing since at least the 80s, I think it's going to start to turn hot. I think that open warfare is afoot. I think that that's where we're going. And if you think I'm full of shit, say so. Put down in the comments here and, and tell me what you think. But I think we're on our way to, to the Civil War, the Second Civil War. And I don't think that there's anything to stop it.